This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. If you like listening to beautiful voices like ours, instead of reading words, then head on over to Audible, where you can get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash paratruth, where you can choose from over 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Christian and non-Christian paranormal investigators. They have two different views, and it seems as if neither of them can ever agree on anything. So what happens when a mainstream view of the paranormal crosses paths with the Christian view? Something This is Paratruth Radio. What's going on, Parafans? Welcome to a brand new episode of Paratruth Radio. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And I hope you guys had an amazing Halloween. I know that we were off last week, but I hope you enjoyed the episode with Steve Hummel and as we talked about his paranormal museum. And that basically was our Halloween episode, so I I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys got caught up on any of the... Uh, archives that we've got. If you caught us on any of the networks, I did throw an archive up for them to play. Uh, so definitely am excited for this week's episode. But uh, first off, how was your Halloween there, sir? It was good, just like always. Uh, you know, plenty of candy, which is kind of a bad thing because I've been trying to keep somewhat healthy lately <laughs> uh, for workout purposes, but Halloween, man, just just can't do it. And then Thanksgiving, pass. and then <laughs> it's coming up. I know, dude. I mean, the bowl of candy sitting there. What am I to do? Just leave it alone? It looks so lonely. <laughs> you could give it out to the children that are knocking at the door. Children don't need candy. <laughs> they got plenty of energy. Yeah. I'm 31. I'm out of energy. Yeah. I need sugar. 31. <laughs> wait till 36, brother. <laughs> So uh, we got an amazing episode for you guys. I I want to get into it and uh, just it's going to be an awesome show. So let's get going on with it here. Conspiracies exist throughout history, but few conspiracy theorists may claim that Gandhi, the Titanic and Shakespeare are somehow linked. Tonight, we learn more about their connection in this episode of PTR. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, for those of you listening at TMV Cafe, Fringe Radio Network, Paranormal UK Radio Network, and Paratruthradio.com, let's get ready to expose some lies. Tim Spearman is a conspiracy researcher who has spent years studying various conspiracy theories, including, but not limited to, Jack the Ripper, the Twin Towers, and channeling. Tim began the interview by telling us a little bit about his history in education and conspiracy research before moving on to a discussion about Shakespeare, Gandhi, and the Titanic. We begin the interview with Shakespeare and why Tim believes that Shakespeare's writings were actually a compilation of numerous writings from various authors. Letters and many other primary source documents that Francis Bacon was the Queen's illegitimate son, who was then a changeling son that was given to the illustrious scholars, Lord and Lady Bacon, to raise and to educate as a ward of the court. And his half-brother, Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, who has uh, become a favorite candidate for their Shakespeare plays, was, in fact, another illegitimate son of Queen Elizabeth I. So in Romeo and Juliet, in the balcony scene, we get many clues to this. For example, Romeo says, By a name I cannot tell thee who I am. Indeed not. Not if you were born Edward Tudor Seymour, and then had to change your name to Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, and then 
later had to change your name to William Shakespeare as part of a covert operation where you were working for a propaganda ministry run by the British Crown under the leadership of Her Majesty's Secret Service and your brother's secret writing ministry known as Frau Rosie Cross, also known as the Honorable Order of the Knights of the Helmet, named in honor of Pallas Athena, who was the goddess of the Greek theater in Athens. And it would not be natural that you would name yourself in honor of her as a dramatist, hence Shakespeare, because she was the spear shaker who through the dramatic arts and the enlightening and educating of the masses through the dramatic arts actually shook her spear at the twin serpents of ignorance and vice. So given that Will Shakespeare was a childhood friend of both Francis Bacon and Edward de Vere, it stood to reason that they could use him as the front man since his name so closely resembled that of the pen name they adopted for their joint works the Shakespeare plays, and the name was hyphenated for many of the editions that came out, Shake hyphen Spear, with the spelling S-P-E-A-R-E, uh, which we come to see as the canonized spelling of Shakespeare, mm-hmm. but it, it was initially a hyphenated name, Shake hyphen Spear, which points to the fact that it was the pen name that they had adopted from the nickname of Pallas Athena, the goddess of the Greek theater. So the first play that was performed at Gray's Inn in the dining hall was a comedy of errors, which was about two twins that looked so much alike that the audience were inclined to confuse them for one another. So therefore that set up the whole covert operation to conceal the authorship so that the royal princes could conceal their identities and use the front man, Will Shakespeare, as the so-called bard. And uh, so they set up the whole covert operation with this clever first play because Will Shakespeare and William Shakespeare are like, are like twins because the name so closely resembles um, the name uh, William Shakespeare. This name, Will Shakespeare, is very, very close in, in terms of its sound and mm. it can act as a good double. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I think the biggest clue is in the balcony scene where Romeo and Juliet are conversing and she says, what's in a name that which is called a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, if he were not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which she owns without the title. Title, of course, refers to the title of prince, which he's not able to own because of the illegitimacy of his birth. Right. And so when it's said... Uh, you know, by a name, um, sorry, uh, when, it, when it said in there that, uh, you know, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, this refers to the Tudor rose, the rose of the Tudor family, the red rose of the Tudor family, which he cannot bear, but even though he doesn't bear the name of the rose, he still smells as sweet because he's got the royal bloodline of Her Majesty, the Queen of England. So do you feel that uh, that they put these different um, indicators into the plays to, to insinuate that this this was not just one person that was William Shakespeare? I think uh, what they did was they wanted to leave clues for posterity so that scholars of the future would begin to put the story together and then unravel the mystery and uh, put the pieces together to, to solve the puzzle. But let's not forget that one of the names of the team of good pens that Bacon created was called the Wild Goose Club. So the chase for the authorship is a wild goose chase, the chase to establish the true authorship of the Shakespeare plays is something of a wild goose chase. But suffice to say that it was a collective effort. We're talking about a team consisting of 70 scholars that are doing translation work and scholarly work uh, where they're translating a lot of the texts 
from the continent um, or the Incanabula texts from the Middle East that were smuggled into Europe during the Crusades. Mm. And then they're, you know, uh, basically uh, educating themselves in the process and then using this knowledge that's been distilled and inputting it into the plays um, themselves. And they're updating the plays as they go. So long after Will Shakespeare had died in 1616, you have the Shakespeare folio being published in 1623, in which Francis Bacon is in charge and has increased the size of several of the plays and made huge additions and actually because he had changed some of his scientific theories in 1622 he therefore had to make those changes regarding geography and um, astrophysics type uh, theories related to the moon he had to update them to match what he had written in his scientific writings like Novus Organum and other books that he had written, and thus he had to make those same uh, changes in Hamlet to keep the science consistent, and and did so out of a desire for accuracy as well, because he was a meticulous scientific mind. Mm. So what this proves is that reformations were made to the play in a consistent style with which with what had already been written and uh, the play had virtually doubled in size after long after Will Shakespeare's death. There are cipher clues also in the plays, mathematically devised cipher clues, uh, which make it definitively and unarguably true that Francis Bacon assumed a role of overseeing these plays. Like, for example, in Love's Labor's Lost, there's the long word that appears on, I believe, page 250. And the word count and the page number add up to the numerological value of the long word, which is honorific abilities or something. It's a very <laughs> long word. But, but anyway... This long word, when unscrambled and put in proper sequence, becomes a Latin hexagram, which then, when translated, says in English, these plays are F. Bacon's preserved for the world. Hmm. And given that the word count of the word and the, the fact that it appears on the page where it does and on the particular line where it does... Uh, all this points to a mathematical, mathematically devised cipher, which shows that it couldn't have possibly been placed in the text by coincidence, and that it's been being drawn attention to for a reason. And when you put all the math together, in addition to the cipher clue itself, you get the fact that this must be the case that the Grand Empresario, who's in charge of the whole Shakespeare project, is Francis Bacon. Hmm. Hmm. It's really interesting that you know it, it, we have a lot of different theories that come up uh, just in general, you know, uh, about the world. Uh, and this is actually really interesting. Because th personally, this is the first time I'm actually hearing this theory mm -hmm. uh, in and of itself. Um, but you know, one thing that Justin and I really want to do, we want to try to figure out what the connection is between these three. So I'm going to go ahead and shift the conversation a little bit here. Uh, and I actually want to bring up Titanic next because most people believe based on the movie. And of course the documentation that is out <laughs> that the Titanic simply ran into an iceberg some way, somehow, and that's how it sunk. However, uh, you mentioned that it actually the damage to the hall itself almost appears to have been an explosion that came with from within the uh, Titanic instead of from the outside. Uh, but you also go on to mention that uh, there is speculation that it was more of an attack uh, of a number of Freemasons against each other. Uh, you mentioned the law of one. Forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, but is it Cable or Cabal? Uh, a Freemasonry? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the, 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 the group known as the, the Law of One, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, which are, by some researchers, are believed to be the good guys. And then you have the New World Order Masons, which are considered the bad guys. And that there must have been some type of, uh, uh, I, I guess, some type of, uh, I guess, inside war or battle. And that they ended up, the New World Order Masons, I guess, ended up uh, trying to sink this boat to destroy some of these guys uh, from the Law of Cabell. So uh, can you just explain a little bit about uh, where this information comes from and how it differentiates from the original story and maybe where they have some similarities? Sure, sure. I'd be glad to. Um, Probably one of the better research books on the subject of the Titanic is one written by John Hamer called RMS Olympic. And he goes into great depth in this book to explain the various anomalies that show that there's factual information and historical information that does not jive with the official story related to the disaster. And he produces evidence to show that there was actually a, 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 a swap, uh, that the two ships, the Titanic and the Olympic, were actually swapped. Um, they were twin ships in the sense that they were built to design um, features to be quite similar in appearance and in weight and tonnage and so forth. And that adjustments were made just prior to the launch of the so-called Titanic on its so-called maiden voyage to make them look more alike. And it's believed by several researchers that the ships were swapped and the date given for the swap has often been considered to be April 1st, which is April Fool's Day. Um, The fact that the ships bear the title the Olympic and the Titanic points to the War of the Gods. Uh, the war between the Titans and the Olympians in ancient Greek mythology. And so that would suggest that there are two rival factions vying for control in terms of world government and that one of them will seek descendancy over the other and see to it that the other is removed from the fray. And so if you could create a Hamlet-like mousetrap to make sure that those that you wish to entice on board the death ship would be finding the um, invitation irresistible because of the glamour associated with the event and the fact that they would wish to rub shoulders with uh, anyone who's anyone to be seen as, uh, you know, part of the who's who of who's what. (laughs) <laughs> they are elitists that want to, you know, be seen at these public events. They wouldn't want to be left out. And so you have three illustrious bankers being enticed on board, John Astor, Isidore Strauss, and Benjamin Guggenheim, two of which are U.S. congressmen, John Astor being one. And so they're blocking or attempting to block the bill called the Aldrich Bill, which was conceived by these elitists on an island off the coast of, I believe, Georgia, called Jekyll Island. And so the famous book, The Monster from Jekyll Island, refers to this meeting that took place and the consequence of that meeting, which was to create a bill that would inaugurate the Federal Reserve Bank. And It came into being in 1913, which is exactly one year after the Titanic disaster of 1912. And so J.P. Morgan was behind the construction of the White Star shipping line, uh, ocean liners, the big ones, you know, the Olympic, the Titanic, etc. And he was a Vatican banker, um, which means that he was a Jesuit for all intents and purposes and was working for the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church. They wanted inroads within the United States. 
and they wanted to make sure that they could gain control over the government and that the country would be basically uh, subordinate to their wishes and their whims. And so they created this consortium of banks, all of which were Rothschild owned. And the Rothschilds, though they're considered to be an Orthodox Jewish family, are in fact Jesuits. They work for the Jesuit order. And the reason they were chosen as uh, chosen for the role is because no one would suspect that a family perceived as an Orthodox Jewish family would be beholden to Rome. They wouldn't believe that they would work for the Catholic Church. And so anyway, this consortium of banks formed this so-called Federal Reserve, which is not federal and has no reserve, and prints treasury notes for the U.S. government and then charges interest on the printing of money, which should be printed for free by the Bank of America. But obviously they do this for the purpose of creating the very system of usury that they use as a blackmail tool to gain control of all the world governments. And so the situation is no different with the Bank of Canada or the Bank of England or for that matter, the Bank of India or any other country. There are a couple of holdouts from my research that uh, have not, where they have not managed to gain a foothold and assumed control over their national banks. I won't bother mentioning which countries I believe those to be because of the, I frankly, I'm not a specialist in that area and I might be wrong. Mm-hmm. So I'll leave that to other researchers <laughs> to establish. But this is the story anyway. So I, I think the uh, what you were mentioning about the explosion on board, it happened near the bow below the waterline. Um, it was a perceived as a coal bunker explosion. Okay. I believe it wasn't. I believe they planted gelignite inside a piece of coal and actually created the explosion. And of course, who would know the difference? Um, coal bunker explosions do occur. But the point is that Captain Smith did not order that the fires be put out before they embarked on their voyage. And so they left the port of Southampton and began the transatlantic journey without the fire being put out. It was still burning. Uh, he has, according to John Hamer, who recounted the various seagoing accidents that Captain Smith had been involved in, it's startling because there's about 20 different seagoing accidents that Captain E.J. Smith was directly involved in as the captain of various vessels that experienced these accidents at sea, everything from explosions in various quarters of the ship, which cost the lives of crew members or running aground here or there. One shipping accident happened at Sandy Hook, um, off the coast of North America and the Mm -hmm. keel of the ship was damaged. And so hence, since the Olympic had been involved in many, I think three um, accidents uh, where he was at the helm, it required some kind of emergency measure to deal with this situation because such huge construction costs had gone up in the construction of the ship that it they needed to reclaim their losses because any inspection would prove that it was unseaworthy and it would be required that it be taken out of commission and so they as commonly was done in the day they swapped the ships for insurance fraud purposes. And this is not a one-off. 
this happened repeatedly in that period. It was a common hmm. modus operandi of the various mafia organizations that ran these shipping lines. The White Star shipping line was owned by the Jesuit order, by the way, of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously White Star refers to Sirius, the dog star, which has all kinds of occult related significance to it because it's the morning star and Lucifer means the morning star. And it's also called in Egyptian mythology Set. Sirius is the god Set. And uh, so Set is where we get the name Satan. And so if you connect the dots, you can realize that there's something deeply disturbing going on, especially when you consider that the Rothschilds are not a Orthodox Jewish family, but in fact a satanic family mm -hmm. that worship Satan. And that their empire is on Threadneedle Street in London, which is in mockery of the Avangels proverb that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they're basically thumbing their nose at the Avangel and saying, well, sorry, Jesus, but we've threaded the needle and we're doing very well living in heaven as the richest family on planet Earth. So if you don't mind, <laughs> you know, move over. Um, so, yeah, so Threadneedle Street, right? And um, they, uh, I think it's Meyer Amschel Bauer who changed his name to Meyer Amschel Rothschild derived the name Rothschild from the um, emblem that he had on the front of his accounting house in Frankfurt, Germany, which was a hexagram star, which was red in color. Hence, it was a red shield, and it represented the number of the beast because it had six points, six sides, and six triangles included within it, which represented in geometrical form the number of the beast. <laughs> so it's it's really fascinating to, to, to see, isn't it? All these hidden <laughs> meanings and Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Well yeah. for a while I've I've heard several people say that, you know, the Titanic was sunk due to a new world order conspiracy to 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 thin the the human race as it were because there is this uh supposed plan by the the new world order to thin us out to i believe it's 500 or 50 million i believe is the number yeah um so it is interesting to 500,000 yeah yeah that's oh, 500 it 500 million sorry 500 yeah. million so it's on the georgia guidestones it's actually the right. first commandment yeah right yeah yeah so it's interesting to see because it, it at, at some point as as i've done research i you know i loved the story of the titanic um even before the movie and all that came out um <laughs> that and, and you know doing a lot of the research it, and hearing some theories about it and it's almost like well maybe 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 there was more to it than just this i mean even if it wasn't a an explosion but a purposeful hit of of an iceberg or something like that um you, you know it, it would raise eyebrows to to say that the titanic might have been something more than just an accident so it's it's really interesting yeah. that you have come across the the correlation that there there was even more to it than just that um the last spot we wanted to to stop here because there uh, you had said that there's a, a distinct connection between these three pr particular topics is Gandhi. And on the website, it, it uh, you say that Gandhi was actually an Illuminati double agent. Um, what made you come across like that particular line of thought? And, and what research did you come across that actually proves that? Okay, well... Um... I wouldn't say proved. I would say shows substantial evidence to suggest. Sure, yeah. Um, 
you know, I mean, we have to be humble, and uh, we weren't there, and we can only speculate. Speculate, right? yeah, right. And, mm-hmm. and I, I think there's quite a lot of evidence to show that it's really possible. And whether it's true or not, I can say that the man can be faulted, that he was no saint, and he made many mistakes uh, that cost his country dear. And I do believe that it's an, either an indication that he was so idealistic that he actually delivered harm rather than benefit to his people. But let's just say that Nadarum Godze the assassin of Gandhi made his defense in court. He didn't have a trial lawyer to defend him. He decided uh, to conduct his own legal defense. He pleaded guilty to the charge of murder, but pleaded innocent to several other charges that were made against him. And then he launched into a defense of his actions, and he referred to the man that he had killed as Don DG, which is a great honorific way of referring to the man. It was basically saying the beloved Gandhi, you know, it okay. was an honorific way of referring to him. And so he did have respect for the man that he felt that he had no choice but to remove from this world um, because of the harm he felt he was doing to the people of the country that he was assigned to lead and to protect. And he felt that he wasn't doing his job. He was leaving the Hindus of India helpless against the advances of a terrorist organization called the Muslim League, which was terrorizing the people of West Bengal and Calcutta, now Kolkata, uh, and uh, slaughtering men, women, and children, and um, leaving the Hindu population defenseless to defend itself against these armed aggressions. And um, he would speak out repeatedly whenever Hindus showed um, anger or a, a display of of dis, disaffection, I suppose, or, or, or discord over the whole um, goings-on, uh, especially if their anger was directed towards Muslims. Um, but he would speak in defense. Muslims and never uh, in my reckoning did he say anything critical against the Muslim community. He embraced the policy of appeasement, which was similar to the policy of appeasement that Prime Minister Chamberlain uh, used during the advent to the Second World War, where he was constantly engaged in a policy of appeasement towards Germany. Um, I believe the same policy of appeasement is being used in Europe currently uh, with regard to the Muslim community. And it's a complete replay of what Gandhi and the Congress Party was doing in India. And there was an ambition, according to Nodarum Gadze, to, um, according to letters and according to evidence that he had managed to, to discover that Gandhi was actually engaged in negotiations with the Amir of Afghanistan, who he was encouraging to invade India in order to found a Muslim caliphate in India. And he also, according to Nodaram Gadze in his courtroom defense, was planning to make Hindustani the language of India, which was actually Urdu, which uh, is the language of Pakistan, and it's spoken by the large majority of the Muslims that uh, live in Pakistan and in northern India. It's a 
kind of lingua franca uh, language that unites Muslims in the Indian subcontinent. And he was going to impose this language on Indians, and uh, he was calling it Hindustani. Um, so all of this is recounted in the courtroom defense given by Nodaram Godze, but yet not single one single word of it was allowed to be printed in any of the national newspapers, and the Congress party sent armed police into the courtroom to ensure that not a word of his testimony was printed nationally. Hmm. And the uh, police actually took the notebooks out of the journalists hands and tore them up and stamped on them with their boots and insisted that they not print a single word of his testimony. And this was all recorded in a book called May It Please Your Honor, written by Notre Dame Godze's brother, Gopal Godze, who for all intents and purposes is just merely recording, transcribing, and sharing what his brother had said in court. Hmm. And during, I mean, with, with this type of research, I know there's a lot of people out there who, who almost might be offended by some of the oh, some outrage. of the claims of stuff. I mean, yeah, I mean, have you had people even backlash on your website or to you about this? Well, I've had my academic career ended, as did my co-author Colonel G. B. Singh, who was teaching at the University of Tennessee and was fired from his tenured position there at the university, and so he sued the university, and so far as I can deduce, he won the case, but it took five years for him to do so. Mm -hmm. I was, um, well, I've had problems keeping my academic position throughout my career, but in the last college that I taught at a corrupt dean who probably was a Freemason and certainly knew about my Gandhi research and my Gandhi book, basically fabricated a case against me so that my contract as a part-time instructor at the college would not be renewed. Um, and the case that he fabricated was based on a false allegation of my conduct and, mm. you know, uh, good riddance. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't want to teach at a higher educational institution ever again in my life because of the experiences that I've had. And I have such a dim view of most academics and most so-called higher educational institutions that I really wouldn't want to sully my reputation by even being associated with them. And even though they've slandered me and tried to make me look like the one who's not above board, it's clear to me that these institutions are deeply corrupt, um, that the degree system itself is based on the first three degrees of Freemasonry. Entered Apprentice, Fellow of the Craft, and Master Mason. And so, so as a bachelor's student, you're, it doesn't matter what you say, what you write, what you think, because if you only graduate with a bachelor's degree, you'll never occupy a high position in society, so they don't care what you think anyway. <laughs> so then when you do the master's degree, you're assigned a supervisor who will tell you which books to read and how to tailor your research so as to pass the master's degree, which is basically a mind control exercise to ensure that not only is your mind controlled and your research controlled, but anyone who reads your work will also have their minds controlled with the view that the establishment would like them to have. It's fascism. That's all it is. And that's all, all it will ever be as long as the system persists. I think it's appalling that Indians in India or Thailanders in Thailand or Indonesians in Indonesia or Far East Asians, which traditionally embraced the Confucian system of matriculation and examination, 
should have to be subjected to a new world order imposed matriculation system known as the university degree system, which is a Western imposition that's been placed on them that doesn't belong. Get mm -hmm. it out. Extricate it. Excise it. Piss on it. Get rid of it. You know? Because we can't allow this one world order takeover. It's arrogant, to say the least, for a start. And it's impolite for another, because how can you assume to impose your system on another culture? Mm -hmm. And it's you know, colonialism, for heaven's sakes. You know, Europe colonized them once, and now it's colonizing them again by insisting that they adopt their model of university education. Get out. Go back home. Leave them alone. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, now, okay, so we, we covered a couple of uh, things here on Gandhi, the Titanic, <clears throat> et cetera. Um, but what we really want to do now is you had mentioned, actually, uh, I believe in the website, but also in an email to us that the three of these things actually connect some way, somehow. Uh, would you mind going into that with us? Absolutely. I'd be pleased. Um, Lord Amptel was the head of the um, Grand Lodge of England, which was basically the it's basically the highest lodge in the whole Freemason uh organization and uh, as the grand uh, master of the Grand Lodge of England he was approached by Reverend J.J. Dulk who wrote the first biography about Gandhi and he asked him if he would write the foreword to the book and in the foreword to the book he claimed not to know either man okay great so if you don't know either men, <laughs> if you don't know either of these individuals, then why are you, you know, putting your reputation on the line to endorse a book about a man that you don't even know? Mm -hmm. He denies knowing Reverend J.J. Doak, right? So why would, jo why would Doak approach him in the first place if he doesn't know him, <laughs> that you know, he doesn't know anything about him. Oh, there's got to be a reason he's going to approach the man. And so, basically, it's one Freemason approaching another Freemason, who's the highest-ranking Freemason in the world, to endorse a book about another Freemason. See, Gandhi wrote the London Diary, which was when he was at the Inner Temple studying in London. It's one of the five inns of court, which is where the aristocracy that would later be the lawmakers and would enter the House of Lords and other illustrious institutions in Britain would gain their legal education. So there's the inner temple, the outer temple, the middle temple, Gray's Inn and Lincoln's Inn. And they're all in the city of London in close proximity to one another. And they were all founded by the Knights Templar. And so the bar or temple bar is where the International Bar Association passed the bar and decide who's going to be a lawyer. And so you have to pass this rigorous law exam in order to pass the bar. And from what I've seen, that isn't even uh, an honest and just system because I have known people that have studied to write the bar and they were led along and made it to the end in fine form and then didn't pass the exam at the end, which basically meant they had to go back to the beginning again. So <laughs> I think they basically decide who gets in to the club and who doesn't in very deceitful and dishonest ways. And I think that this is the legal profession.
profession is supposed to uphold justice is, like most things, uh, a fraud. And anyway, so this um, same man, Lord Ampill, who wrote the foreword for this book written by Reverend J.J. J. Doak, which is Gandhi's first biography, which Gandhi paid for mm -hmm. and had 600 copies printed, which were then sent to the major publications, the newspaper publications in Europe and America, which was the name to turn him into the great figure that he became through a from propaganda, or shall I say propagandi effort on both <laughs> their parts. <laughs> so, That's a good one. That's uh, a good one. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, um, he wrote the London Diary, Gandhi, uh, which is his Freemason diary recounting his rise through the 33 degrees of Freemasonry. I don't know how far up the ladder he went because only 20 pages of the London Diary survived and the rest have disappeared even though those who compiled the great, the complete works of Mahatma Gandhi went to great pains to record everything that he wrote in letter form or in written form, everything, every scrap they could find, they included in this CD-ROM version of the complete works that we know of as his writings, and yet... A hundred pages of the London Diary have disappeared, even though it was entrusted in the safekeeping of, I believe, his nephew or one of his relatives. It was uh, only 20 pages survived. And what those 20 pages are, are a description in coded form of his initiation to the third degree of Freemasonry. So obviously there's an effort to conceal the fact that he's a Freemason. Why would you want to do that? Probably mm -hmm. because by association you would connect the dots and realize that as an inductee of a military knighthood organization, he would be well positioned to enter the intelligence services and to become an MI6 agent of Her Majesty's government. And um, Lord Amphill, who wrote the foreword to this biography about Gandhi, also presided over the laying of a foundation stone for a theater in Stratford-upon-Avon in order to continue to promote the lie that the bar, that the author of the Shakespeare plays had been born in Stratford and to continue the lie that this commoner named Will Shakespeare was the author of the Shakespeare plays. So not only was he continuing a 400-year-old lie, but he was in the process of cultivating a new lie that Gandhi was the saint of the 20th century that was a messiah-like figure to take Jesus' place. Hmm. He is anything but. I have a picture of him wearing his sergeant major uniform. I have a picture of him with his ambulance team that he formed when in South Africa, which he opportunistically decided to form because he wanted the British government to give him permission to found his own Indian militia. And you can tell me that a man who wants to found an Indian army in South Africa is a man of peace and a saint? I say bullshit. <laughs> and then he also had, the, you know, pictures of him wearing his, his long coat uh, with his top hat looking like an English gentleman. Um, obviously in his lawyer garb in South Africa, and he was an appalling barrister, by the way. He lost most of the cases and didn't show any particular legal skill. And he lied about the racial train and coach incident in which he claims to have been thrown off a train and a coach in South Africa. They were based on composite stories related to men that he actually defended in court who had had those 
um, human rights violations committed against them. And so he just basically created a composite story and claimed that it happened to him. <laughs> he had a passport given to him by a very high-ranking South African official to grant him the permission to travel as a man of color in the first class section of all trains in South Africa. And with that passport, there was no legal official that could possibly ex evict him from first class um, under any circumstances. I mean, it was clear to anyone that that passport came from a government official and that if anyone made mischief with Gandhi in any way, there would be huge repercussions and that person would lose their job. So there's no way anyone would evict him from a first class compartment on a train. It's, so obviously, lie after lie after lie after lie, and where do we stop the lies? By blowing the whistle on them, exposing them, and seeing to it that people get it. And to stop, you know, this tendency for people to have a sacred cow of one kind or another that they refuse to let go of. Come on, people. It's time to grow up, you know? It's, it's time to realize that the fairy tales that we were told as children are just that, fairy tales. And it's time to grow up. It's time to acknowledge that history and what you've been told is a fabrication. And when you're presented with good solid evidence that that's the case. Have the maturity to examine it before you dismiss it simply because you're mind-controlled, brainwashed, and you've invested so much of your energy in believing the lie that you suffer from attachment to the lie and you don't want to give it up. Grow up, you know? Wake up. Because as long as you continue to allow them to lie to you, you will have more Las Vegas events. You'll have more Sandy Hook school shooting events. You're going to have more 9-11s and all the other nonsense that they have been orchestrating. And you're going to let them get away with it because you're not going to look into the facts and you're not going to look into the truth. Don't complain to me about being too busy and I've got a family and I don't have time for this. I do all of that and I do what I do. So, so can you. All right. Well, Tim, we are at the end of the show here. So what we want to do is give you a moment here to tell everybody where they can find you and uh, feel free to tell any other information you'd like to. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, my website shakesaspear.com. Um, all you have to do is do a Google search with Timothy Spearman on um, Google or on YouTube, and you're going to find a whole bunch of content that you can look at. There's past radio shows on YouTube. There's, a, there's even a a recording session for a radio play on the Titanic on YouTube. Um, we're planning to turn it into a, a film, but um, it's not there yet. It's in process. And, uh, and if you go on Amazon, you can find the books under Timothy Spearman that have been written. And so feel free to order... Um, what books are are available for order? Um, I've got more books coming out, but you know it's it's all a process and it takes time. And but uh, thank you very much uh, for for having me on, Justin. I enjoyed talking with you, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, and well, I feel your pain for the writing because I am a writer as well. So I, <laughs> it, it is hard to yeah. get get books out there. Um, so um, I do want you to stay on the line with us 
Um, folks, you are listening to Paratruth Radio. We've been talking to Tim Spearman. We are letting him go, but stay tuned. We will be right back after this break. A creature emerges from his slumber, only to be told he is a griffin with the name Achilles. The twisted mind of Dr. York Hempshine believed he could keep such a creature in a lab without consequences. However, bigger secrets are being revealed. What is this mad scientist doing with creatures and humans? The legendary creatures project The Griffin by Justin Conciliar, available now at Amazon.com. Get your copy today before the lights get turned off on this project. Good evening, folks, and welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And we just got off the line with Tim Spearman, uh, and we had an awesome and very interesting conversation about a number of conspiracy theories, in particular those three, for those of you just tuning in, shame on you, but because you missed it, we just discussed uh, a number of conspiracy theories about Shakespeare, the Titanic, and Gandhi, and how the three of them are interconnected. A lot of information was given out on the show tonight. Uh, full hours worth, which is awesome. Mm. Um, but with all that information, Justin, uh, I think I'm just curious, as always, to know what your take is on it. Has anything that he had mentioned changed your mind about the history of any of these three subjects? And if so, how did that happen or how did it? Um, I'm not sure it really changed my mind, but it does raise questions for me. Uh, William Shakespeare, which – we've known as one of the most prolific uh, playwriters of all time. It, it would be plausible that it was more than just one writer and that his name was not actually Shakespeare, um, but Will Shakespeare, as he, as uh, Tim was saying, as well as the, the other author or uh, writers that, that he mentioned. Um, the other one, um, is the Titanic being something more than an accident? I think there's a lot of people that do believe that now compared to uh, years ago. And there has been several researchers saying there was more to the, this than just an accident. The Gandhi thing, to me, it was a little bit out there, but I can I can see his, his research and how he was coming to the conclusion that he did but to me that really doesn't pull me in the way of that is actually what had happened there what about you well you know one thing that i really like about tim and when you looked at his website is he doesn't really water anything down no matter what the topic is that he's discussing you'll notice that there are just pages upon pages of information so he goes into great depth with it uh which is really interesting and intriguing in and of itself because nowadays we have a lot of people who like to discuss conspiracies some of them we actually consider or talk uh uh i'm sorry talk call them conspiracy theorists they call themselves conspiracy theorists um but they water everything down they leave you a couple paragraphs and expect you to believe them just like that where tim is really coming at you with all kinds of information from a number of different sources he mentions his sources so you can double check them yourself which is great um but yeah in the end you know it, it, it's hard to swallow uh some of this stuff you know especially for someone like us who you know we study conspiracies we're we're within the mix but we're not avid researchers of conspiracy mm-hmm. uh and so things like shakespeare things like the titanic things like gandhi uh which we have been you know had many many years of uh uh history lessons about those subjects those people and, and the uh uh the incident with the titanic you know all that stuff is kind of drilled into our minds and so trying to shift that into a new way of thinking is very difficult. And I think mm. everyone can agree. Like it does, it's not just conspiracies, but anything in general, you know, you have a certain belief system. It's hard to shake that belief system. Mm. Um, unless there's something very compelling. And I think that some of the things that he discussed was compelling. Uh, and I know like during the interview, I was sharing some pictures with you about that Titanic because we had mentioned how, or I had brought it up and Tim had mentioned it in the story uh, on his website 
that it would appear that there's some type of explosive device, if you will, mm. uh, within the hull of the ship that when exploded caused the metal to fracture outwardly, uh, where you would think, OK, if an iceberg hit it, it would fracture everything inwardly and we'd have this dent with a gaping hole. And so I ended up sending you a picture that I that I found uh, as he, he was uh, describing the incident. Mm. And I think it's a compelling theory just on the picture alone. Uh, we, we, I showed Justin. It's a picture of what the hall looked like or looks like uh, and how the two sheets of metal overlap each other. And then there's rivets. And basically what they're saying is what happened is that when it hit the iceberg, it popped the rivets and caused the one sheet, which was overlapping the undersheet, to fold outward, giving it the appearance of an outward explosion, when in reality, the dent just morphed the metal. Now, I say reality in the terms that what I'm saying is true. Again, we don't know for sure. You know, either one can be true. Um, and so it is in the, in the world of conspiracy. You got to really decipher the information yourself uh, and come to your own conclusion. And so, again, you know, I think there's a lot of compelling info here that he shared. Um I think a lot of it is very hard to chew, hard to swallow. And as we had mentioned and discussed with him, a lot of people tend to find this stuff uh, very heart wrenching or mind wrenching. You know, mm. uh, people just have lashed out because of some of these theories, especially about Gandhi, mm. uh, which makes sense. Right. Um, but, yeah, you know, I mean, personally, I don't think any of it really changes my own uh, worldview. But. As a host of Paratruth Radio, I am willing to leave my mind open to it, you know, and take in the information. And I think that's the big thing that I know we've mentioned this number of times on the show, guys. Uh, just because you have your mind open to something doesn't mean you need to accept that thing that you're open to. Right. Um, it's just information. You know, it's knowledge. So, yeah, I don't know. I hope – I want to hear what everyone else out there thinks. Uh, for those of you who've tuned in uh, and listened to the show, what are your thoughts on these three topics? Uh, do you agree with anything that Tim was saying? Do you have any thoughts of your own or, uh, you know, how has this shaped or reshaped your current understanding of Shakespeare, the Titanic and or Gandhi? Uh, and of course, if you have any other theories, uh, either on these topics or any other conspiracy theories, feel free to share them with us at Paratruth Radio, uh, at gmail.com or of course probably the easiest and best way it would be facebook.com forward slash paratruth radio uh we'll be able to connect with you right away in real time uh and of course any other way that you can connect with us paratruthradio.com i know there's a section on there you can hit us up with and uh etc cetera, etc cetera. so just google us and you'll be able to find all that informa information yeah absolutely i i want to hear you guys thoughts on any topics that we talk about not even just today but I, I do agree there. Um, I wanted to bring up really fast, folks, that uh, if you haven't checked it out, go to paratruthradio.com and check out the T-shirts that we have up there. Uh, I am very proud of these sh shirts, so I want you guys to check them out. And if you so choose to, um, buy one of those bad boys because... Choose to, choose to, choose to. Choose to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it is paratruth memorabilia. Want a t-shirt? Um, and also make sure you're Buy checking out. Buy the memorabilia. Well, that, hey, that hey, is really cool. distracting. Roll with it. Roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to do what they do in you know the old records. <laughs> what do they call? Well, that? then they have to play it backwards so that they hear the the message. But they don't need to do that here. It's they don't need to do that here. <laughs> Subliminal messages. This is what yes, that's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> they don't even hear me, but they know it. They know it's something. Go ahead. Continue on, please. Um, make sure you check out all the networks that we're on, Paranormal UK Radio Network, TMV Cafe, and Fringe Radio Network, as well as Radio and Podcast.com. Uh, any further thoughts from you before we end uh, up? Uh, on tonight's show, no, but again, I hope everyone had a happy Halloween, and I hope you're looking forward to it, as we all are. To the Thanksgiving season, I know I'm looking forward to all the grub in a couple of weeks. And, of course, that leads us into none other than Christmas, mm -hmm. which is going to be a fun time for Paratruth Radio. Yep. Uh, but other than that, guys, it's so nice to talk with you guys again after two weeks. Yep. So uh, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it, too. Yep. All right, folks. Until next week, where you will find us the same time, same channel. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. Peace.